Welcome to lecture 7.2, Ideals, Quotient Rings, and Finite Fields. To motivate the concept of an ideal, let's recall back when we were studying the theory of groups that we could quotient out by a subgroup if and only if it is a normal subgroup. The analog of this for rings are things that are called two-sided ideals. Here's a definition. A subring, I of R, is a left ideal if all products of the form R times X for something in R times something in I remains in I. Right ideals and two-sided ideals are defined similarly. So the way to think about this is left ideals are subrings such that when you multiply the elements in the ideal on the left, you remain in the ideal. Equivalently, this says that I times, let's use our coset notation, R times I, in other words, the, the set of all products of R times something in I, this remains in I. So this is a left ideal. A right ideal is a subring that is invariant under right multiplication. So if you multiply anything in I on the right, then you remain in I. And if both of these things are true, then you have a two-sided ideal. In other words, these are the subrings such that you take any element and you multiply on the left or the right, they remain in the ideal. If R is commutative, in other words, xy always equals yx, then all left or right ideals are automatically two-sided. We use the term ideal and two-sided ideal synonymously, and we use the same notation that we do for normal subgroups. So this means that I is an ideal of R. Let's do some examples. First of all, the integers z is a commutative ring, and the subring nz is a two-sided ideal. This is the set of all multiples of n. Next, if R is the ring of two by two matrices over the real numbers, then this following set of matrices, where the second column is zero, that is a left ideal, but not a right ideal of R. And to see why, well, let's take A zero C zero. And if we multiply it on the left by a matrix, let's say X, Y, Z, W, and then what do we get? So to multiply matrices, we're doing rows here by columns. So this first entry is that row times that column. And so that th this is, is non-zero. This next entry is this row times that column of zeros. So that's definitely a zero. This entry is this row times that column. That's something non-zero, most likely. And this entry is this row times that column. That's going to be zero. So this thing remains in I. So it's preserved. These matrices are preserved under left multiplication. However, if we multiply matrix like this on the right, A0, zero, C0, zero, times X, Y, Z, zero, now we have these rows times these columns. Well, what do we get? We get AX, we get AY, we get CX and CY, and that's generally not going to be in I. Third example, or actually a non-example, the set of symmetric n by n matrices is a subring of the set of n by n matrices, but it is not an ideal. It's not a left ideal or a right ideal. So I should say when I say it's not an ideal, I'm implying it's not any kind of ideal. Because it's very easy to take a symmetric matrix, A, B, B, C, and find a matrix, a different matrix to multiply by. It doesn't matter whether you multiply on the left or the right to get something that is not going to be symmetric. So that's a subring, but it is not any kind of ideal. 
Okay, more on ideals. A basic remark, that's probably a little bit too simple to call an actual theorem, it says, if an ideal I contains the multiplicative identity 1, then I is the entire ring R. And here I say ideal, but this holds for left ideals, right ideals, or two-sided ideals. Let's prove this. So let's suppose that 1 is in our ideal. And let's take an arbitrary element in our ring, little r. And we will show that little r is in the ideal. And since little r is arbitrary, that means every element in the ring is in the ideal. Well, by definition, r times 1 is in the ideal, because 1 is in the ideal. And therefore, r is in the ideal. And since this is an arbitrary element of the ring, that means the ideal has to be all of r. And that's it. Now, it is not hard to modify the above result and proof to show that if the ideal i contains any unit, in other words, any element that has a multiplicative inverse, then the ideal has to be the entire ring. And that's something that is left for the homework. Next, I want to compare the concept of a normal subgroup to that of an ideal. So normal subgroups are characterized by being invariant under conjugation. And by that I mean that a subgroup H is normal if and only if all elements of this form, G, H, G inverse, remain in H for all G in big G and H in big H. In other words, you conjugate something in H, you remain in H. Similarly, left ideals of rings are characterized by being invariant under left multiplication. And by this I mean that a subring I of R is a left ideal if and only if all products of the form little r times little i remain in the ideal. And this is for all little r in the ring and little i in the ideal. In other words, if we start with something in the ideal and we multiply i on the left, then we remain in the ideal. Now, a quick comment. When I say invariant under conjugation, and I have this condition here, an equivalent way to state this is by saying that g h big H, g inverse, so this set of elements is contained in H. That's what it means for the subgroup H to be invariant under conjugation. And similarly down here, this condition is equivalent to saying that little r times big I, so this set of elements, the set of little r times things in I, is contained in the ideal I itself. So this is what it means to be invariant under conjugation, and this is what it means to be invariant under left multiplication. And finally, right ideals of rings are characterized similarly. Just swap the order of R and I, and you can modify this for two-sided ideals. If you want, you can say, well, they're left and right ideals. In other words, they're invariant under both, or if you want to do it in one full swoop, you can modify it and say that R I times S is contained in I. Although it might be the case that you require your ring to have identity for this condition. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, almost all rings that we ever deal with have identity anyway. So that's, that's, that's a minor detail that I'm not going to worry about. Next, I want to talk about ideals generated by sets. Remember how in group theory we could have subgroups that were generated by a single element or two elements or a subset of possibly infinitely many elements. Similarly, the left ideal of a ring generated by a set x of r is defined as follows. So we write it as x with parentheses around it and it is the intersection of all left ideals that contain our set x. This is the smallest left ideal containing our set x. 
clearly, there are analogous definitions of this by replacing the word left and left ideal with right or two-sided. Just replace the word down here as well. And let me say a word about the notation here. Some books, instead of writing X in parentheses, use angle brackets because that's what's done with subgroups, so why not do it with ideals? Well, I don't know. For whatever reason, parentheses is probably a little bit more common than angle brackets, though either one it should be clear what you mean. So if we have an ideal generated by a single element, as is often the case, we don't write it, or we don't include the set braces, we might write something like this, the ideal generated by R. Or if we have an ideal generated by three elements, we might write something like this. We just list them out, again, like we do for subgroups. Okay, so let's recall, back in group theory, there were two ways to define the subgroup generated by a subset of G. The first one, perhaps the most natural one, was, as I called it, from the bottom up. So you define it as the set of all finite products of elements in X. So in other words, you look at so X1, X2, X5, and X8. If, if all of these things are in X, then this element is in the subgroup generated by X. Or X5, X3, X4 inverse is in the subgroup generated by X, and so on. The second way was, in my words, from the top down. So here you start with the entire ring, or I guess the entire group, and you intersect all subgroups that contain X, and then what you get is the same, the same thing here. Now, you, we had to prove that these two things were equivalent in group theory. That's something that you did on the homework. And this sort of dichotomy, two ways to construct the subgroup or ideal or whatever structure generated by a set, this appears in a lot of other areas of math as well. For example, the, a subspace generated by a set of elements in a vector space can be defined as all linear combinations of elements in the subset, or it can be defined as the intersection of all subspace that contains the subset. Now, it's important to be careful because this doesn't always work for all algebraic structures. Sometimes you get annoying cases where you define the intersection of a bunch of things, and it turns out to not be of that type if you're intersecting infinitely many of them. For example, to show these things are equivalent, for groups, you have to show that the intersection of an arbitrary number of subgroups is, in fact, a non-empty subgroup. And if you replace the word group with some other type of weird structure, that may fail. Fortunately, for rings, there also are two analogous ways like this to define the ideal generated by a subset. And proving this will be left for the homework. So this says that let's let R be a ring. Now here it has to have unity. So it has to have a multiplicative identity element 1. In this case, the ideal generated by a subset X, here I'm going to do left, right, and two-sided separately, is, well, let's first do the left ideal. It's the set of all, I'm going to call this linear combinations of things in X, where you multiply by things in R on the left. For right ideals, you look at all linear combinations of things in X multiplied by things in R on the right. And then for two-sided ideals, you look at all linear combinations of things in X, where you multiply on the left by something in R and on the right by something in R as well. And of course, because R has unity, you are perfectly allowed to make any of these things equal 1. So you can think of this as being closed under the, these so-called left linear combination and right linear combination, respectively. Ever since introducing ideals, I've been saying that they are the ring analog of normal subgroups and groups. 
And now I want to take that a step further. So recall how we can quotient out by a subgroup of a group if and only if it is normal. Now I'm going to show you how you can do that when you have a two-sided ideal in a ring. So since an ideal of a ring is an additive subgroup, meaning it is a subgroup of this abelian group that is under addition, well then it's a normal subgroup of the additive group, and we can define R mod I, like we did in group theory, to be the set of all cosets of I in R. So I'm just going to say cosets because the left cosets and the right cosets are the same by normality. Also, since I is normal, R mod I is a quotient group. And the binary operation, how do you add two cosets? Well, first of all, we're doing addition. So it's defined as follows. The coset X plus I plus the coset Y plus I, we just add the representatives together and we get X plus Y plus I. So that's what we learned. We studied normal subgroups in group theory. It turns out that if I is not just any ideal, but a two-sided ideal, then we can make this set of cosets, or this quotient group, into a ring. Now we have most of it already. We have, we have the, the set of cosets, we have addition, so to make it into a ring, we just have to show that we have multiplication. Here is that formally. If I is a two-sided ideal of the ring R, then R mod I is a ring called a quotient ring, and multiplication is defined as follows. The product of the coset X plus I plus the coset Y plus I is defined as X times Y plus I, so that coset. To prove this, all we really have to do is show that this definition of multiplication is well-defined. In other words, that it does not depend on the choice of representative. So if we multiply this coset by that coset, I might call this coset X plus I, and you might call it R plus I for a different representative. And same thing with this coset. So using our particular representatives X and Y to get X, Y plus I, we better arrive at the same coset. That is, let's suppose that this coset x plus i is also equal to r plus i, so maybe I chose x as a representative and you chose r, and this coset y plus i is also equal to s plus i. So I chose y as my representative and you chose s. Well, then that means that x minus r is in i, and y minus s is in i as well. And recall that that's, that's what it means for these cosets to be equal. Now, I know we're usually used to multiplicative notation, and in that case, when we say, like, g times h equals k times h, then that is the same thing as saying g k inverse is in h. But this is the same thing, it's just additive notation. So the, the inverse, additive inverse is minus r and minus s. So it suffices to show, for well-definedness, that what I get when I multiply x plus i times y plus i, which is x, y plus i, is the same thing as what you get when you multiply your choice of representative, r plus i, times s plus i, which of course is r, s, plus i. Equivalently, this means that the difference of our representatives, x, y minus r, s, the additive inverse of r, s, has to lie in i. So let's check that. x, y minus r, s. So here's a sneaky little trick now. I am going to add 0 to this. Notice that minus ry plus ry is equal to 0. Now, why am I doing this? Well, now I'm going to take these first two terms, and I can factor out y on the right, and these two terms, I can factor out an r on the left. 
In other words, I can write this as x minus r times y. That's these two terms right here. Plus r times y minus s. That's these two terms right here. And I claim this is an i. And think about why. So x minus r, as we know, is in the ideal i, as is y minus s. It's also in i. So i is a two-sided ideal, meaning if you take anything in i, like x minus r, and you multiply by an arbitrary ring element, say y on the right, it remains in i. And similarly, take something in i, namely y minus s, and multiply on the left by r, and you also remain in i because it's a two-sided ideal. And now ideals are subrings, so we have two things here that are in the ideal, and so their sum has to be in the ideal as well. So that's all we had to show. Well, technically, we probably should verify that the distributive law holds, but I claim that that is very trivial. I encourage you to try it yourself. There's nothing tricky about that. And that establishes the proposition that anytime we have a two-sided ideal, then R mod I can be made into a ring because this definition of multiplication of cosets is well-defined. The last topic of this lecture is finite fields. Now, we've already seen a while ago that ZP is a field if P is prime. And we've also seen in the previous lecture that finite integral domains are fields. In other words, if we have a ring that is finite and there are no zero divisors, then it is a field. But what do these other finite fields look like? Like, what types of things are finite integral domains? One thing we know that they are not are rings Zn, where n is composite. For example, let's take Z4. Well, in here we have 2, which is a zero divisor, because 4 is not prime. 2 times 2 is 0. And so there's no way that this is going to be a field. However, we will see that there is a finite field of size 4, but it's not going to be Z4. Okay, so let's let R be the polynomial ring over the field Z2. So this is the set of all polynomials where coefficients are either 0 or 1. Now because we're over Z2, we can ignore all negative signs because plus 1 equals negative 1. So anytime we have x minus a, we can write this as x plus a. Now the polynomial, x squared plus x plus 1, let's call that f of x, that is irreducible over z2. Now, how, how would you check that? Well, remember that polynomials, if they have degree 2 or degree 3, then they are irreducible if and only if they don't have a root. Well, you can check that this polynomial does not have a root over z2. Well, how do you check? You just plug in 0 and you plug in 1. And both of those yield 1, which is not 0. So this polynomial has no roots over z2. There's only two possibilities, so it's irreducible. Let's consider the ideal i generated by the polynomial x squared plus x plus 1. So that is the set of all multiples of x squared plus x plus 1. And see why that is, by definition, this ideal is, well, it's an, first of all, it's a two-sided ideal because our ring is commutative, so multiplication commutes. So I can write this as all elements r of x times x squared plus x plus 1, where r of x is a, in big R, in other words, a polynomial over z2. So when I say multiples of this, I mean that polynomial times an arbitrary polynomial over z2. So that's the ideal. In the quotient ring, 
r mod i, we're essentially making this polynomial equal to the additive identity. So we have the relation x squared plus x plus 1 equals 0. Now formally what I mean by this is, if you want to be really formal, x squared plus x plus 1 plus, the, plus i, this coset is equal to 0 plus i or just i. So that's what we mean by this. But you can think of it as the polynomial is equal to 0 in the quotient. Equivalently, x squared equals minus x minus 1 because we can just solve for x squared in this equation. And of course, minus x minus 1 is the same as x plus 1 because we can ignore negative signs over z2. So the quotient only has four elements because we're looking at all polynomials over z2 and any time we have an x squared in it, we can replace it with an x plus 1. So we can iteratively eliminate all powers of x that are greater than 2. So we only get four elements remaining. We get 0 plus i, 1 plus i, x plus i, and x plus 1 plus i. Again, if we have any other polynomial plus i, then we can replace the higher powers of x. Like every x squared we replace with x plus 1 until we get down to the representative having degree 0 or 1. And these are the only four possibilities. As we've done previously with the quotient group, z mod nz, or now we can think of it as a quotient ring, we usually drop the, the i here. For example, we don't write the element 5 plus 12z. So here's an element of z mod 12z, which we've seen in the past. Usually we... We just write 5 is an element of Zn, and we just, again, we, we drop this clunky plus i business. So R mod i, this quotient ring, is a set of polynomials mod this ideal. We can think of it as being isomorphic to these four polynomials, 0, 1, x, and x plus 1. So addition is obvious, just modulo 2, right? And multiplication is the same thing. It's modulo 2. But anytime we have an x squared, we just replace it with x plus 1. It is easy to check that this is a field. And I'll show you that on the next slide. Here on the left is a Cayley diagram. I'll explain the green arrows in a moment. And the operation tables, in other words, the addition and the multiplication tables for r mod i, the quotient ring, which is just the polynomials over z2 mod x squared plus x plus 1. So now we really have two groups here. We have an additive group of four elements and a multiplicative group of three elements. And this Cayley diagram is really those two Cayley diagrams overlaid on each other. So the additive group, you can see, is clearly isomorphic to the Klein 4 group v4. So it's not cyclic and it's generated by 1 and x. So the Cayley diagram is on four nodes with the red arrows for 1 and the blue arrows for x. Now the multiplicative group has order 3, so it's cyclic, and the identity element now is 1, the multiplicative identity. So the additive identity is 0, the multiplicative identity is 1, and the group only has three elements, so it's only these three elements right here. Just ignore zero. So x plus 1 is a generator. So I've denoted that by the dotted green arrows over here. So when I said this is a Cayley diagram, I really should say these are the Cayley diagrams overlaid each other. I will conclude with a theorem that I will state without proof, as I've done with several results on field theory. This says that there exists a finite field, we denote this fq, so of order q, and it's unique up to isomorphism. If and only if q is the power of a prime, 
for some prime p. Now, if n is equal to 1, and it's obvious what this finite field is, it, it's just the ring zp, as we've seen before. But if n is greater than 1, then this unique field is isomorphic to the following quotient ring. Set of all polynomials over zp modulo the ideal generated by f, which is any irreducible polynomial of degree n. So for example, the unique finite field of order 4, which we write as f4, is isomorphic. Now we haven't technically learned what is isomorphic rings are, or fields, but hopefully you should have a, a very clear picture as to what that should mean conceptually, and that's all I want. Now, isomorphism will be covered in the next lecture. Anyway, so f4 is isomorphic to the polynomials over z2 modulo x squared plus x plus 1. On your homework, I want you to construct the addition and multiplication tables of two more finite fields. One of them is f8, which by this theorem is isomorphic to polynomials of, well, I should say polynomials over z2 modulo a irreducible polynomial of degree 3. So in other words, find a polynomial over z2 that has no roots in the so-called prime field z2. So in other words, f of 0 and f of 1 all have to be non-zero, so they basically have to be 1. And finally, the last one that I'm going to have you do is the finite field f9, which will be isomorphic to, by this theorem, 9 is 3 squared, so 3 goes down here in the p, and then 2 goes up here in the exponent. So f9, the unique finite field of order 9, is isomorphic to the, r the ring of polynomials over z3, so the coefficients are 0, 1, and 2, modulo a irreducible polynomial g, and here this polynomial g has to have degree 2. So here, g of 0, so find any polynomial where g of 0 is non-zero, g of 1 is non-zero, and g of 2 is non-zero as well. That will ensure that g has no roots over z3, and so it has to be irreducible, and this field will have nine elements, and so again, I want you to construct the Cayley diagram and both of the operation tables for both of these fields on your homework. In closing, it's worth mentioning that much of the error correcting techniques in the field of coding theory are built using mathematics over the finite field of order 256. So coding theory is an area of applied mathematics involving encrypting and sending coded messages subject to possibly perturbations of the bits or errors. So if there are such errors, then you want to be able to not only recognize the errors, but fix them as well. So these types of algorithms are what allows your CD or DVD or Blu-ray disc to play despite scratches. So there's a lot of advanced mathematics behind the scenes, and a lot of it strongly involves theory of finite fields.